to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here again with Bill Schofield and with John Harrigan. Hey guys, how's your week been? Good. Yep. Pretty good. Another day in paradise here in Northern California. Nice, nice. And same in Cairo, I'm assuming? Yeah. Yeah, it's starting to warm up a little bit. It's nice up. Nice, nice, nice. Same here in Texas. We had an 80 degree day the other day. And then a cold front came through and yesterday was like 55. And uh, I don't know, I think today is going to be in the mid 50s again. Not too bad. Not too bad. Well, Great to be with you guys. We're excited about our episode this week, I suppose. But before super we jump stoked. in, we just want to <laughs> we're super stoked. <laughs> we we just want to give a quick review of our last episode where we continued our look at the book of Revelation. And we gave an overview of the major themes and features in the book. And I think we said the book really is just not that hard to understand. But what often comes to mind when people think about the book of Revelation is just a bunch of imagery that is really confusing. And I think we get all sorts of depictions of angels and scrolls and dragons and locusts and beasts with heads and horns and prostitutes and Babylon and all sorts of things, and the list could go on. But even with all of that imagery, we made the point that the debated part of Revelation, Revelation 6 through 18 is just a rehash of the trauma and the tribulation associated with this, what the scriptures call the day of the Lord. And we discussed the messianic woes uh, a little bit, or just sometimes called the great tribulation in our last couple of episodes, just a common theme that's in the Torah and the prophets from passages like Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, as well as passages from prophets like Isaiah 13, Isaiah 24, Zephaniah 1, Daniel 12, um, and others. And we also developed from some Second Temple literature uh, and other passages like the Apocalypse of the Twelve Calamities uh, from Second Baruch, and then the Eagle Vision from Fourth Ezra, and then the Animal Apocalypse from First Enoch, and the Cloud Apocalypse from Second Baruch. And all of those passages from the scriptures and from Second Temple literature play significantly into how we should understand the book of Revelation. And I think one of our main takeaways from the last episode Uh, was that even if the imagery seems really strange, the message communicated by the book of Revelation is straightforward. It's Jewish eschatology. Uh, Woes are coming, but glory is coming. And so until that day, we embrace the faithful witness, uh, we take up our cross, even unto martyrdom, in anticipation of what's to come. And so, as we've said so often in our podcast, uh, eschatology drives discipleship, and the book of Revelation is no different in that respect uh, than the Torah or the prophets or the epistles. So in today's episode, we want to talk about the book of Revelation once again. Specifically, we want to talk around the subject of kiliasm, or perhaps more popularly understood as millennialism. Kiliasmos, just the Greek equivalent of the Latin word millennium, just means a thousand years. And so because a lot of Western evangelical thought and and discipleship and eschatology specifically is rooted in an eschatological system of dispensationalism, it's really common, at least here in America, for the average believer to at least have heard about the millennium from a passage like Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And that's where John writes that, you know, those who had been beheaded for the testimony of uh, their, their testimony to Jesus lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And so this is actually something we've had a lot of questions come in about. And so we wanted to work through this topic a bit more than just for a few minutes on one of our Q&A episodes. So guys, let's get into this. This golden age, this seemingly transitional time of a thousand years. I mean, you get premillennialism, you get postmillennialism, you get amillennialism, as if this term or these few verses in Revelation have such a determining factor for so many theological or or really eschatological tradition. So how should we understand this? Is there anything in the scriptures or in Second Temple literature that really gives support for kiliasm? Where should we begin? That's a great question. And there's kind of a reason we've put this off till the end. (laughs) Um, So so the idea basically comes uh, from two places. Uh, The first is simply the idea of a transitional messianic kingdom that and and there is some 
you know, there's there's various ideas about how a transitional messianic kingdom would look. We'll go over a few of the references in Jewish literature that imply a transition. Now, in addition to the idea of a transitional kingdom, so where and what we mean by that is it looks like there's a it looked like there might be a reference to a to a period of time where um, the Messiah is reigning, and yet it's not the eternal state yet. And so that would be a transitional, a tr- the idea of a transitional kingdom. And so in addition to that, we'll go over a few passages that imply a, a transition, whether it's explicit or not. And in addition to that, a lot of those ideas get wrapped up in the conversation of, of Kiliasm. So the idea that there's specifically going to be a thousand-year transitional period, which is not super common, but, but, we, but it's pretty much known in the academic world where the idea came from. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But prophetic literature, you know, has passages like Daniel 2. So anywhere you read something like, where there's the rock cut out of the mountain, and that rock will fill the whole earth. Basically, anything that involves a process is a lot of times, especially by dispensationalists, is a lot of times brought into the conversation as evidence for a millennium. If there's a process involved, then there's clearly a millennium in some people's mind. And that's not quite the case, but we understand what they're saying in some sense. Yeah, and I think, you know, you have this uh, not such a stark apocalyptic dynamics in some of the prophetic literature. And so as the apocalyptic tradition begins to develop, then you have kind of speculation on kind of the dynamics of the of that processing going on. So 4th Ezra 7 is a great example where you have a transitional messianic kingdom, but it's not strictly a thousand years, and it's actually only 400 years. So 4th Ezra 7, it says, uh, For my son, the Messiah, shall be revealed with those who are with him, and those who remain shall rejoice 400 years. And after these years, my son, the Messiah, shall die, and all who draw human breath, and the world shall be turned back to primeval silence for seven days as it was at the first beginnings so that no one shall be left. And after seven days, the world which is not yet awake shall be roused and that which is corruptible shall perish and the earth shall give up those who are asleep in it. The chambers shall give up the souls which have been committed to them and the most high shall be revealed upon the seat of judgment and compassion will pass away. Patience shall be withdrawn and judgment alone shall remain, etc. And so, and Gehenna is revealed in verse 36 and paradise opposite of that. And so, um, it sounds a lot like kind of Revelation 20 and Revelation 21, where there's a transitional messianic reign and then a final eschatological judgment. So, there is precedent for kind of a, a, a transitional idea in Second Temple literature that corresponds not strictly the Kiliastic, but it corresponds to the same pattern. Yeah, John. So, I mean, clearly some sort of transitional idea that we see in 4th Ezra. But what about like a strict Kiliasm, like a strict 1,000 years? You know, where does that come from? Yeah, I think that comes from, it's mainly based on what's called the cosmic week theory or the, the creation day world age idea that each day of creation represents an age of a thousand years. And, um, that is specifically based on, uh, exposition of Genesis 2 7. For in the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge and good, of good and evil, you will die. So, for example, in Jubilees 4, it says, verse 29, And at the end of the 19th Jubilee, in the seventh week, in the sixth year, Adam died, and all of his children buried him in the land of his creation. 
And he was the first who was buried in the earth, and he lacked 70 years from 1,000 years. For a 1,000 years are like one day in the testimony of heaven. And therefore it's written concerning the tree of knowledge, in the day that you eat from it, you will die. Therefore, he did not complete the years of this day because he died in it. So you get a reference to Psalm 90, uh, you know, where... Uh, the Psalm of Moses, where it says, uh, you return mankind to dust, saying, return descendants of Adam, for in your sight a thousand years are like yesterday that pass, or a day in your sight. And so, uh, so you get a reference to Psalm 90, kind of tacked on to interpreting Genesis 2, where he died short of a thousand years. And therefore, that's how you interpret in the day that you eat of it, you will die. So a day is like a thousand years in the Lord's sight. Therefore, each day of creation represents a thousand years. And you get the inference that there's going to be seven days of creation, six days of divine labor, and then a seventh day of divine rest. Right. So this so this is this comes from Jubilees. So the point of Jubilees, like their like Jubilees thing, Jubilees contribution to the to the corpus is that they see the author of Jubilees sees history is divided up into fifty year cycles, like Shemitah Jubilee cycles. And so it and so everything fits together in these numbers like this. And so the thousand years becomes another secondary theme in Jubilees that the that the world is kind of broken up into thousand year periods, roughly. And so you also have reference because of the influence of Jubilees, you also have um like another reference in Second Enoch thirty-three. And Second Enoch is is you know, kind of a contemporary text with the book of Revelations, written probably second century, second, I'm sorry, second century, probably late first century, maybe a little bit earlier, but, you know, that's a conservative guess. But, um, so second Enoch chapter 33, God shows Enoch the epoch of this world, the existence of 7,000 years, and the 8,000th is the end. So slightly different than what you know a lot of people would think of Kiliasm. Neither years nor months nor weeks nor days. Then on the eighth day I likewise appointed, so that the eighth day might be the first, the first created of my week, that it should revolve in the revolution of seven thousand, so that the eight thousand might be in the beginning of a time not reckoned and unending, neither years nor months nor weeks nor days nor hours, like the first day of the week, so also is the eighth day of the week might return continually. So the idea, again, is taking the week and playing it out. And they don't mention specifically that the 7,000 would be like a Sabbath, like other passages do, but the idea is that it's divided up into 7,000 years in the eternal state will be the eighth. And so, you know, people take from that that the seventh will be like a will be like a Sabbath because of because of it being compared to a week. Right. Another reference that is a little bit less like direct and clear is out of the life of Adam and Eve um, in the last chapter, which is kind of a postscript, but uh, after Eve dies, it says all her children buried her with great weeping. Then when they had mourned for four days, the archangel Michael appeared to them and said to Seth, man of God, do not prolong mourning your dead more than six days because the seventh day is a sign of the resurrection, the rest of the coming age. And on the seventh day, the Lord rested from all his works. So you get kind of a reasoning there that revolves around the creation day world age idea that each day of creation represents an age of history, not specifically, you know, here it's not explicit in life of Adam and Eve as each day is a thousand years, but it's this kind of reasoning that then gets really picked up in the apostolic fathers after the book of revelation and just, you know, takes off from there. Yeah. And interestingly, that idea also 
gets caught up in some of the mystical rabbinic literature because um, even even contemporary uh, Judaism, kind of in the more mystical strand of Judaism, talks about Shabbat as being somehow mystically transporting the adherence of Shabbat to the age to come. And so there's still a strong connection, even in modern Judaism, in, in some of the more mystical strands of modern Judaism, with Sabbath and the age to come. So that's an interesting connection I hadn't thought about with the life of Adam and Eve. Yeah, yeah super interesting. Wow. Well, I mean, guys, even with these references from Second Temple literature— one of the big points we want to emphasize is that Kiliasm really is like a sub-idea within Jewish apocalyptic thought. It's not something that is front and center like things like the kingdom or the resurrection of the dead or the day of the Lord or the day of judgment or Gehenna, these these themes we've been talking about for episodes now on our podcast. Um, it really is a sub-idea like the Nephilim, right? If you've ever heard of the Nephilim, Genesis 6 and you know, it, it, it's <laughs> it's there, but it's just not a widely emphasized idea. So chiliasm is is similar. It, it's not a widely emphasized idea, and and this I think really explains why it's not seen in the Gospels or the Epistles. I mean, I suppose you know if someone could reference some sort of chiliastic idea in. Paul's letters or, or anywhere in the epistles, you might be able to mention 1 Corinthians 15, but I don't know. I mean, the point being, chiliasm is just not a widely emphasized idea in Jewish apocalyptic thought. Yeah, I mean, you only have, you know, four or five references, chiliastic type references in, in all of Jewish apocalyptic literature, which, you know, like you're saying, uh, the Nephilim is is definitely the first 35 chapters of First Enoch. It's heavy, and then, you know, there's sporadic references uh, in the rest and other letters, but it's not really picked up in the New Testament. Does it mean that they didn't, um, they didn't believe it? The apostles didn't believe in some sort of uh, angel-human interaction in Genesis 6? I'm not really sure. Uh, the point is, is there's a lot of different ideas floating around and the New Testament really zeroes in on the big ones that are kind of front and center, like you're saying. Yeah. And so I think, I think that that really is the most coherent reason why chiliasm or millennialism is not seen in the gospels or epistles. And first yeah. Corinthians 15 can go either way. First yeah. Corinthians 15 could be a reference to, um, you know, some sort of transition, or it just could be a reference to the judgment seat of Christ. So, you know, uh, verse or is that verse 23, but he, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his, his coming, those who belong to Christ, right? The resurrection. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority and power. So that could just be the judgment seat of Christ yeah. after his coming. Right. And this is, you know, this is what, uh, a lot of reformed or millennialist uh, folks will argue about this passage that it doesn't involve. This isn't speaking of millennialism. Of course, their motivation there is to argue that uh, that Paul is, you know, uh, is reinterpreting Jewish apocalyptic, which I don't think that is necessary either. I think you could read First Corinthians fifteen just within a traditional Jewish apocalyptic framework that he comes. He raises the dead, then he puts all things under his feet at the judgment when he judges the living and the dead, and he hands it over to God the Father into the coming age. Um, and so, or there could be a transition, you know, either, either way. I, 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 I think you could read it either way. But the point is, is that Paul doesn't reference Kiliasm anywhere else right. in his epistles. So, right. uh, that's that could be a stretch if you're putting all your weight into uh, a couple verses there in, in First Corinthians 15. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And and really on both sides of that conversation, if your if your framework for viewing the Bible is so systematized that it hinges 
on the interpretation of First Corinthians 15 or Daniel 2, then it's just not that strong, honestly. Yeah. That's especially since since nobody in the first century thought in terms of systematic theology. They they didn't truth didn't come in neat little packages that you can throw on your shelf. <laughs> so it's just not the way just not the way they thought about the world. It's a very post enlightenment way of thinking. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you if you have a system of thought that hinges on these kind of rigid interpretations of systematic theology, it it kind of is more evidence of the lateness and thus the inauthenticity of the framework. Mm. But so what we can say is that Revelation did, um, after, after the book of Revelation, the impact of it was that uh, Kiliasm was widely accepted by the apostolic fathers. And it, it, you know, there's different different ways you can look at it. My opinion is that it probably had to do with it was a it was a convenient way to basically be able to take you know what what it was implied in Revelation and to maintain Jewish apocalyptic expectation even after a lot of the Jewish leadership of the Christian movement kind of was was uh, going away. And so they could maintain a lot of the ideas using the the concept of a millennium that John talked about in in Revelation. And so it it's clearly very popular and widely accepted by the the early leaders like for the first couple centuries, almost, you know, universally accepted. And so that's important to point out that while we don't necessarily see it as the emphasis in the New Testament or of the prophets, it's clearly widely accepted as true after that by church leaders, and um, we can speculate as to why that is, but it seemed like it was a helpful tool to kind of maintain the apocalyptic expectation within whatever scenario they found themselves at the time. Yeah, yeah, and at that time, you know, they were functioning kind of on a different time scale because they were working primarily off the Septuagint, which is about 1,500 years uh, ahead of, Good uh, right. you know, the Masoretic text. So at that time, they, you know, if they're expecting a strict Kiliasm, the apostolic fathers, then the deduction is that Jesus is going to return at 500 AD. So there's a great passage where Hippolytus, uh, his commentary on Daniel and Hippolytus kind of extrapolates that out. He says, since then in six days, God made all things. It follows that 6,000 years must be fulfilled and they are not yet fulfilled. As John in Revelation says, five are fallen. One is, that is the six. The other is not yet to come. In mentioning the other, he specifies the seventh in which there is rest. But, but some uh, but someone may be ready to say, how will you prove to me that the Savior was born in year 5500? <laughs> and so the Masoretic, you know, text, what we're kind of familiar with that's that, that became the standard uh, after the Septuagint fell out of, of favor, views that the Savior was born around 4000. And so he says, how will you prove to me the Savior was born in the year 5500? Learn that easily, O man, from the birth of Christ. Then we must reckon 500 years that must that remain to make up 6,000, and thus the end shall be. So that was only, you know, a, a couple hundred years out from Hippolytus that he was expecting kind of that Kiliastic time table to to come to fulfillment. Right. Of course, by the time you get to 500 AD, then Kiliasm has fallen out of favor and and it's not uh, popular at all. Right. Apocalyptic thoughts not not popular at all. So, but <laughs> the point is is that in the early church they're functioning kind of on a different timetable and it was still relatively near. It wasn't, you know, 2000 years off for them uh, like it is for us. Yeah. Good yeah. point. Yeah, guys, great points. And I think, you know, this could lead us into talking about some of the questions that we received. We we kind of put some of these questions off, though we've received a, a fair number of them. And 
you know, rather than, again, as I mentioned earlier on, rather than taking just a few minutes to try to tackle these things in a Q and A episode, we said, okay, this, these deserve to be, uh, kind of discussed a little bit more. Um, and so we would just want to just for a few minutes here, take some of your questions based on what we've been talking about so far about Kiliasm and, and the millennium. We want to talk about just a few of your questions. So first one here comes from Terry, who says, I've been listening to your podcast and I've been really enjoying your teaching. I'm not caught up to date. So maybe you've answered this question before, but no, we haven't, Terry. So you're good now. Is there a difference in the 1000 year reign of Christ on earth from Revelation 20 and the eternal age in Revelation 21 and 22? It just seems like when reading the prophets, they seem to speak of this as one big event, but it seems to be separated in Revela- Revelation, beginning particularly at Revelation 20, verse 7. So how do we answer this, guys? Um, yeah, I mean, there's not really an answer. I think there's a tension of apocalyptic thought and kiliastic thought yeah, and how those two uh, mesh together. And under in the Lord's wisdom, he revealed, he gave this uh, revelation to John the Apostle that uh, concludes in a kiliastic manner that this age transitions into the age to come with a thousand years. And so this is kind of a minority uh, idea in, in Jewish apocalyptic thought that seems to be um, uh, stamped as true or confirmed as true by the revelation given to John. And so that then leads to the explosion of Kiliastic thought in the Apostolic Fathers. And you can find, you know, listings of those from, you know, the Epistle of Barnabas to Irenaeus, to Hippolytus, and Methodius. The, uh, there's lots of different examples where it's real clearly spelled out kind of uh, commentary on Revelation 20. Yeah. Yeah, John, for sure. Well, the next question we have comes from Brian. He says, here's my question. Is the day of the Lord one literal day? Is it a period of time? Is it synonymous with the millennium? Do you have any specific teaching on the specific aspects of the day of the Lord? What do you think about this? Um, yeah, uh, Brian, I don't know what uh, tradition you come from, but this is actually a dispensationalist discussion where they, they again, it's because so much is riding on the millennium, the existence of a millennium and issues related to the millennium, including the day of the Lord, because you got to have all the days match up. Um, they become they become really really important because because so much is riding on Kiliasm and the transitional kingdom. So <clears throat> I I would say. Um, you know, it's kind of like in the prophets, it's kind of Isaiah 2, Isaiah 13, the day of the Lord is just that day of judgment. But in other passages like Joel 2, the day of the Lord is spelled out, and there's no way you're going to get that army going through the land of Israel and leaving it like a desolate wasteland in a day, and the the whole process doesn't happen in a day. Yeah, And so... It's, you know, it, it just seems, at least by the first century, the day of the Lord just seems to be kind of like the kingdom of God. It seems to be a catchphrase for a few ideas. And it's not it's not so much a literal day as it is a, it's a catchphrase for some of the concepts that involved a day of judgment and the day when God makes things right. Yeah. Yeah. Great thoughts, for sure. Yeah. And I think, Bill... You know, the dispensationalism, particularly the millennium, wasn't such a big deal until you had kind of the reform circles in the 40s and 50s really start to press the dispensationalist movement on the contradictions surrounding the kind of uh, dualistic soteriology, the two plans of yeah. salvation that play out, one for the Gentiles in the immaterial world and one for the Jews in the material world on earth. And uh, and so specifically around the new covenant and, and how that works. And so uh, a lot of the emphasis in revised dispensationalism you know, Charles Ryrie and John Walvoord and, and, uh, Pentecost and those guys, they really pushed kind of the, 
the theological system finds fulfillment in the millennium. Yep. And, uh, and that's where, like, you know, the system holds up is that you have a Jewish plan of salvation that's being fulfilled on the earth during the millennium and a Gentile plan of salvation in, in an immaterial heaven that's playing out during the millennium. And then the eternal state, you know, uh, Ryrie puts it in the Im- in immaterial heaven after the millennium. Pentecost puts it on the earth after the millennium. There's, you know, kind of debate. But it's the millennium that becomes kind of the litmus test for orthodoxy. That's kind of where the the system comes to play. So I think a lot of your kind of discussion about the millennium and it being such a, a central focus is really derives from that that period of time and in, in uh, dispensationalist thought. And of course, you know, dispensationalism has evolved be or has kind of the progressive movement has kind of moved on from that ultra specific focus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, our last question is from Chris, and his question is about Second Peter 3, which I think would be helpful maybe at some point in the future to do a more complete episode on. But Chris's question says, what is Second Peter 3 talking about? I've heard antagonistic views of the day of the Lord use Second Peter 3 to kind of downplay the centrality of, the restored, of a restored Israel in the millennium, also downplay life after the millennium in general, that Jesus comes in fire, the elements are burned, and so how do unbelievers not perish. It seems like Peter's understanding of the day of the Lord bypasses the millennium and jumps straight into the new heavens and the new earth. Any clarity on this passage, please? Um, I, I think it's representative of the apostolic witness, um, that the apostolic witness is, uh, before the revelation given to John is generally apocalyptic, that there was, a a uh, uh, a fairly simple two age view of history and the day of God does usher in the age to come. And there wasn't much emphasis made it. Maybe Peter had in mind, um, a kind of kiliastic idea. He references, you know, Psalm 90 with the Lord a day is a thousand years, thousand years a day. But Peter's push Peter's reason for referencing Psalm 90 is not kiliastic, but rather simply that time is relative and right, uh, exactly. the the delay in the coming of the day of God is because time is relative to God. A day is a thousand years. So Peter references Psalm, uh, Psalm 90 not to justify a kiliastic view of history, but right. simply to justify the delay. Um, does that mean that Peter doesn't have in mind, you know, in the back of his mind, the possibility of a kiliastic transition into the age to come? I don't know. Maybe so. Um, but I don't think it's really necessary. Uh, and I don't think it's helpful to try to read into Second Peter 3 some sort of kiliasm. Likewise, I don't think it's necessary to argue against kiliasm based on Second Peter 3. I think that's likewise uh, not helpful. Uh, I think, you know, you could say Peter probably held that as a possibility, but he's not going to emphasize it here, you know? Yeah. That's a good point because Psalm 90 definitely doesn't have anything to do with chiliasm. And, and just, uh, just to highlight, um, it's basically a Psalm of complaint. And, and the idea of a day in a thousand years is just a complaint using generalities by Moses, all he's saying is, how long are you going to leave us in this condition? And then he's basically complaining that God can't relate. He's like, God, like for you, a day is just as good as a thousand years. He's not making a a literal statement about how God interacts with time. It's just a statement of complaint. It's not like, it's not, it really isn't kiliastic. So, if Peter had, like John said, if Peter has that in the back of its mind, in, in the back of his mind in Second Peter three, it's not because of Psalm ninety, most likely. Yeah, Bill, and I think you know these questions are just indicative of the classic confusion that surrounds chiliasm and eschatology, because typically 
people assume that eschatology in general is a reference to chiliasm, and that's just because of dispensationalism, right? So all the questions we've received right. about the millennium and about, you know, uh, well, wait, like, if you're talking about Jewish apocalyptic, what about the millennium? I mean, is is there a transitionary period? Is right. there not? Like, what about the thousand years? How does that all fit in? And, you know, and and that's where a lot of confusion generally comes from. Yeah, yeah, they are seen because of, because... Chiliasm is is often seen as a gotcha, one way or the other, for different theological streams, at least in the evangelical world, and so it becomes like a it becomes a battleground, and and it's just while our conclusion is that it seems like it became an emphasis in the early church, it was not an emphasis in the prophets or really in Jewish literature of the time, although there's some references. Um, there's more in the Jewish literature than there is in the prophets, for sure. But at but at some point, it became a helpful way to think about eschatology. But when you read the Bible, to see chiliasm as a synonym to eschatology is just unhelpful. Yeah, that's unnecessary. And if there's some references in there that could imply it, then awesome. But definitely, the 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 emphasis of the prophets is not chiliasm. Right. I, I, I would put this kind of in the category of First Corinthians 13, you know, that um, now we look as in a mirror or a glass dimly or a mirror darkly that Paul was kind of, sure. and Paul's referencing eschatology in that is that uh, Jews in the first century didn't have a systematic uh, approach to God or the scriptures um, it was more, you know, kind of uh, a prophetic approach that is uh, seeks out the basic contours of the future and trusting God that he will bring to pass what he has spoken and that he hasn't spoken everything. He hasn't spoken everything about the future to be known, but he's spoken some things. And the point of the God speaking those things is that we would trust him. And so um, I, I would kind of put chiliasm in that category of yep. right. it's uh, we gaze forward into the future and we use chiliasm as a, uh, a helpful guide that reinforces the expectation of the day of God, a radical reversal of history. There's coming a Messiah. He's going to establish a kingdom in Jerusalem. He's going to punish the wicked. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead. We're going to live forever. And this thing isn't going to go on forever and ever as it is now. If it becomes some sort of dogmatic uh, test for orthodoxy, then that doesn't help discipleship right. in the end. Yeah. It, and it yeah. doesn't uh, spur on disciples to preach the gospel, to focus on the cross, to see people saved from the wrath to come. Yeah. And it really does kind of, I think, lead to the the accusation that Reformed scholars have made that eschatology, the, dispensa the dispensationalist type, leads to uh, a diversion of focus on the gospel. I, I think that has actually been the case. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and this, I mean, I suppose we've already been talking about our so what for the day, you know, our response to chiliasm. I mean, just to kind of wrap up some of our thoughts on it, I think, you know, maybe a point that often gets associated with chiliasm can be date setting, <laughs> mm. Right. And we go, oh, well, okay. So if, if this day age theory, you know, that you spoke about earlier, John from Genesis 2 7 is true. And here we are 4,000 years after. Well, certain people may date set to sometime around, well, I suppose if we're Masoretic text or Septuagint, you know, some people may date set to the year somewhere around 2030. Right. And this would be a best guess, you know, kind of assuming the day age theory. But is this, should this be our response to chiliasm? I, I don't think so. <laughs> right? Right. Um, yeah, I, I agree. That should not be our response, both, both because of the lack of emphasis in the, you know, in the scriptures and <clears throat> even, even the apostles. Again, if Peter believed it, he didn't choose to disciple people with chiliasm. 
That's right. And um, and not to mention the fact that ever since their day, there are so many issues with the calendar that it's just it's just not <laughs> realistic to. Right. Uh, I mean, at least not to get a, a, an exact date. I mean, we can we can say roughly, but uh, but there's just too many issues to get an exact date, anyways. Which is even if chiliasm is true and the day age theory is true, there's still not there's still not really a way to set an exact date. Yeah, yeah, and if it is true, f- praise God. I mean, I, I I'm super stoked if Jesus is returning in 2030 to 2035, whatever. I, whatever. That yeah. would be or <laughs> that would be awesome. I, I yeah. uh, praise God. But regardless of when the Lord is returning, that shouldn't divert our focus on preaching the gospel and making disciples and a focus on right. the proclamation of the cross and the death of the Messiah to justify and cleanse us of our sins, to present us blameless on the day of Christ Jesus, you know, yeah. and, the, and that should Amen. be kind of the center that the Holy Spirit backs up with signs and wonders, that should be the the center of our testimony, regardless of when, where, to what people, at what time, even in the midst of that should be our testimony to the Antichrist himself, yeah. is that God loves yeah. you yeah. and wants to spare you from the wrath to come. You yeah. know, that that yeah. needed to be the testimony in the Nazi concentration camps, flee the yeah. wrath to come because it's at hand and... Um, and God is having mercy on us. And so this should be our testimony regardless of, and it should be urgent. The day of God, the judgment and Gehenna should create the urgency in and of itself. Uh, I think, you know, the nearness, uh, uh, according to our perspective, if it is uh, a decade or two off, then that should bring that should only reinforce the sobriety of the general testimony of the scriptures and the gospels. But if it's not, the sobriety should be there uh, regardless. Yeah, yeah, amen, guys. I mean, our heart is simply to be like the apostles were to preach what the apostles preached. And you know, as we said, chiliasm didn't seem to be a massive part, if anything, uh, of the apostolic witness. And if it is true cool. If it isn't, our message doesn't change. And and so may we continue to preach the cross in light of the coming day and call others to flee the wrath to come. Amen, guys. Well, listeners, thanks for joining us this week. We are super excited about our next episode. We want to take, uh, we've had a lot of questions and, and a lot of people comment right into us or, or make comments on Twitter or send us um, send us notes, you know, through our website, just uh, asking about practical discipleship. You know, what do we do? How do we live? How do I talk to my family or, or how do I, uh, you know, interact with my, my pastors over this, uh, this material or, or, you know, how do we understand Jewish apocalyptic thought and, and what does it mean? And so we want to take a full episode and talk about discipleship in light of the coming kingdom. Just kind of a wrap on our series of episodes on the kingdom. You know, even listeners who have have made comments about these little so what sections at the end of each of our episodes, um, you know, saying that they've been super helpful. So we want to take a full episode and and develop more of what discipleship looks like and look at uh, look at the apostles, look at what they did, look at passages, maybe repeat some of the things we've said before. But I mean, just give super practical advice in terms of how we should walk in light of the day of the Lord and the day of judgment in the age to come. So. Listeners, we hope this episode this week has been encouraging and provoking and uh, brought some clarity to you. Uh, But thanks for joining us and catch up with you next time on the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel. 